at this time uh, for some entertainment uh, as the culinary program serves your lunches, which they'll be doing here very shortly. Uh, please enjoy and help me welcome uh, Sandy McCoy and the Chamber Singers from Lancaster High School. And no, Mr. Greyhouse, I am not singing, so. Uh, but uh, next I'd like to, to introduce representatives from the criminal science uh, program as well as the health tech program to lead us in the national anthem. Pledge of allegiance, I should say. Thank you. You might, may all be seated. Well, thank you all for coming today. I do appreciate it. Uh, this, is, again, is the 2016 State of the Schools Address, uh, brought to you in partnership with uh, a lot of different people here, including uh, the Lancaster City Schools. I uh, would certainly like to thank some individuals before we move on with the program. Uh, first of all, a big thanks to the Criminal Science Department, the Culinary School, uh, Scott Burke and the Lancaster High School Broadcasting and Video Production uh, uh, Department, uh, and a big thanks to Leanne Haight, who I know puts a lot of work into this as well as we're planning for this uh, over the la last few weeks. So uh, please help me give them a round of applause. I'd also like to take an, on, uh, an opportunity to thank our, our media uh, partners. 90.9 .9 is here uh, in broadcasting uh, today's program, WLOH, and of course, Lancaster Eagle Gazette for their coverage. Uh, also, like to take an opportunity to recognize any elected officials. Do we have elected officials here? Maybe raise your hand, please. Great. Thank you for your service as well. Uh, 
I'd also like to take an opportunity to recognize any Chamber of Commerce board members that we have here. Uh, if you could raise your hand. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And finally, I'd like to thank, uh, draw your attention to the program uh, and thank our sponsors. They're listed there. I'm not going to read them all off, but uh, without their support, uh, we really couldn't put on programs like this. So a big thanks to our sponsors. Let's give them a round of applause. Well, we'd like to begin our program today with our first guest. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce Dean Smith of uh, Ohio University, Lancaster. Well, Travis uh, stole my thoughts exactly. That's a hard performance to follow. Um, but it is so exciting to see uh, the energy, enthusiasm of the youth sitting up close. It was so nice to see their eye contact and their enjoyment in that event. Uh, that was really, really well done and amazing. Uh, I'm here to, today to share some things about the Ohio University Lancaster campus uh, and, and our progress in working with individuals in the community on their education, but it's probably important to note that the origins of the campus started in this very building. The beginnings of Ohio University Lancaster back in 1956 when they were looking to uh, establish uh, two-year locations uh, in communities. Uh, it was a partnership with Lancaster City Schools in order to provide space to start that effort. And it wasn't until 1967 that we started the development of the campus that you think of as OUL today. We have uh, come a long way in that regard from what I still hear affectionately called the branch uh, in, in the community. And sometimes folks try to apologize for, for using the term to me. And I say, that's OK. Uh, that is a, is a term that is used to identify a, a satellite location of a university. Uh, and we proudly hold that. Uh, but one of the things I want to do today is try to, to share with you some of the things that have changed since 1956. Uh, I often go into the community and, and some of the things that I will hear is uh, sort of surprise of what we offer. Uh, there is sometimes a, a, a focus on the branch back in the day uh, that was strictly two-year programs and that has changed, a lot has changed. Uh, so some of the things I want to share with you is some of the uh, changing enrollment patterns that we're seeing on the campus itself. And uh, those include the fact that in today's world, our campus pri is primarily bachelor's degree seeking students. And I see that probably likely to continue. Uh, we are reaching on all ends of the spectrum here and we are having an influx of younger students. I'll show you some age information here in a little bit. Uh, but with the College Credit Plus uh, initiative in the state of Ohio, uh, we are seeing younger and younger students on campus as young as 16. Uh, so these are some hard charging students that want to get a head start on college. Uh, and we're in the first year of that process and, and learning things as we go. Uh, one of the other things I'd like to note is we are very much in tune with the economy. And one of the things that uh, has changed for us is that um, we have less full-time students now. Uh, they're able to get jobs, and in some ways I feel that's a good thing, uh, that we're able to have students that are engaged in education and not getting debt very high. Uh, we had a meeting with the chancellor uh, that's responsible for all of higher education in Ohio, and uh, we had a, a several students there, and one of them commented that she will graduate debt-free. And that is really important. Now, she's working to do it, but at a tuition of $5,000 a year, we are basically 25% of the cost of a residential experience. If you're paying room and board in Athens and higher tuition rate, uh, the branch is giving you a, a great value. Uh, with that College Credit Plus movement, we have more young students, but we are seeing also a decrease in our traditional age students because the high school graduation rates are dropping. Uh, this is, you know, a known fact of how many students are in high school, so that is a changing demographic. Now, to put some numbers behind it, what you see in this first slide here is that 33% of our students are bachelor's degree seeking. At this point, only 
uh, 16% of our students are in associate degree programs. Now that's important to the community from an economic development perspective, but it is an area that we will probably see the bachelor's degrees increasing and the associate degrees decreasing in terms of total campus mix. A big chunk of that pie up there is other, uh, and that is our College Credit Plus. Those are transfer students that haven't necessarily declared majors yet. Uh, those are sometimes undecided students, and we are working very hard to eliminate undecided students. Uh, to give you a sense of our portfolio, what you see here is our largest bachelor's degree programs. And for those that are in the back of the room, you may not be able to see that slide. Uh, we have an applied management program that's fairly recent with 119 students. Uh, that's coupled with a business focus in communication studies with over 100 students. We remain an education powerhouse in the community with early childhood and middle childhood. And you can see that uh, there are several hundred students of studying that area. A new program for us is in social work, and that's only capturing part of the picture. That's the pre-social work students, but we also have a, another group of students that are actually in the social work program. Uh, so there's been a fair amount of growth. Uh, on the associate degree side, you see the same emphasis in business, having a business management uh, technology program and a computer uh, technology program that are uh, core pieces up there. Law enforcement is fairly big with us having 80 students in that program that can feed into a criminal justice program. I mentioned the idea of less full-time students, and if you're kind of looking at the, the bar chart there, uh, and people say, I drive past the campus and it, it, it looks like you're doing good and the parking lot's full, and we, we really are tending to stay at 2,500 students if you throw in the Pickerington numbers on top of that. That's only capturing Lancaster there. Um, but the shift, again, is more towards part-time, less full-time, and that is just a factor of the economy. Uh, not a whole lot we can do on that unless we do some, some pretty significant changes, which I'll get to. Uh, this is depicting the issue with uh, changes in age, and the, the sequence of the lines up there, uh, what you see for the youngest portion on the end of that far left of the bell curve there, from fall 13 to fall 14 to fall 15, you can see that number is jumping by hundreds of having younger folks. But then the next segment of that bar over there, what you're seeing is what we'd normally think about as the traditional age students that are finishing between 20 and 23, that number is dropping down. Uh, so it's two factors kind of working together there. Uh, we were uh, fortunate in some ways that we were ramping up while it was big and the programmatic portfolio that we picked I think is serving the community well, but it's also sustaining the campus size. Uh, in 2011, we added our program in applied management. Uh, that was followed in 2012 by a program in social work, and now those are two of our largest programs. So those were nice portfolio picks that match student interest, community need, and it's worked out pretty well in keeping our numbers up. That's not true across the state. Uh, the Ohio University regional campuses are pretty much holding their own in the economy. We're sliding down a little bit in terms of percentage points, uh, but we are seeing some of our community college partners dropping 18% of the time. Uh, I was talking to the dean out at the Eastern Campus in St. Clairsville, and the Belmont Technical College dropped 18% one year, 18% the next year. The president said, we do that again, that's a problem. Uh, you can only take so much of a hit. So there is a changing uh, demographic, a changing number of, of students on campus. Uh, in terms of academics, um, we uh, went through our Higher Learning Commission accreditation report. And if you were to read the report, you would think someone at Ohio University wrote it. Uh, it is extremely glowing. Uh, the first step of the report is the first time in Ohio University's history they visited centers because of the number of centers we had. Uh, the very st first stop on their tour was at the Pickerington Center, and we received great acc accolades for that location and what we're doing there. Uh, they visited the branch campuses, again, very positive. We came through the uh, HLC review very good. They did give us a focus on assessment, uh, and the idea in education right now is focusing on outcomes. Uh, not so much course to course and what was the grade in the course, but how does that all collectively come together for what the graduate needs in the workplace? Uh, another thing that we're focusing on is the state is driving us more and more towards course completion and degree completion, uh, and they're putting the dollars behind it. 
Uh, so no longer is it necessarily a funding model of the person that's in the seat that you're serving, but did you move them along towards a degree? Uh, and this is important from an economic development perspective. The state wants to be able to tout that we have more degree credentialed individuals. Uh, it does pose some problems for us. There are certain areas where employers will send us students for a few courses because that's what the employer needs. The problem on the campus side is that sometimes those are high tech areas that cost a lot of money and the money's tied to finishing a graduate. Uh, so we need to start working with the community on sort of that succession planning and, and talent development and working towards degree completion uh, in order to sustain things. Uh, one of the shifts that uh, is happening on campus is we're having more and more faculty embracing a flipped classroom. Uh, and the idea behind a flipped classroom is rather than having the faculty member be the, the sage on the stage and imparting all the wisdom and starting with the knowledge, there is uh, a responsibility that's placed onto the student to do a whole lot more studying in advance of the class occurring. And they will come in and routinely have quizzes and exams each time they come in because they need to be that prepared so the faculty member can move that conversation from knowledge level to application level. Uh, so it's taking a little bit of adjustment for students to kind of regroup on that and saying there's a lot of tension on me to read, understand, study, be prepared for class. That's a great thing, it's what we all want, uh, but this is sort of driving that process. I'd like to add though that the data is pretty conclusive that that teaching methodology gets you far better results. Uh, so it's not without purpose. Uh, a lot of folks thought online would explode. What we're seeing locally is, is rather than online only, we're seeing a lot of blended. And the idea is blended is you might have a class that only meets one day per week on campus and then the other time is online. So we're kind of using the delivery method that works best for the situation. So where you need that one-to-one -one contact, the eye contact to say are they getting it, do they understand it, group work and things like that, you're on campus. Other times you can be off campus and be chatting asynchronously. Uh, campus issues, like a lot of uh, aging buildings, I mentioned the campus started in 1967, we're facing some deferred maintenance, uh, so we're struggling with the glamorous things of roofs and parking lots that uh, take a lot of money, but those are necessary things to do. Uh, they do hold us back in some ways from growth initiatives. There's not always enough money in the, in the capital bill to do things uh, that we'd like to do in terms of expanding uh, programs and spaces on campus. The fortunate thing is I want to thank the community for really stepping up. Uh, the amount of donations that we receive for the theater, uh, and if you've not been there, I encourage you to come out for a play or come out for an event on campus. Uh, the Wagner Theater uh, had a lot of issues that have been uh, resolved and it is a very nice space, a very functional and useful space at this time, but that took donor support. We went out with a, a request for a quarter million dollars and I was overwhelmed by community support that in less than nine months, I think we were at the 200,000 mark. The amount of support we received to make change was fantastic. We're doing the same thing in terms of the art gallery and a tutoring center space on campus, uh, donor supported. Uh, campus initiatives, and I gotta watch my time here, let Travis know I'm conscious of that. Uh, we have an internship grant. And if you've been at Rotary meetings, we're sharing this. This is a half a million dollar grant where we are helping companies in the area understand what Professor Hoyt calls return on internship investment. It's a concept that he's trying to convey to businesses that we will pay for your intern the first year entirely, we'll pay for it partially in second year, and you pick up a little bit more in third year. So by the fourth year, you are convinced by the data that's provided to you that having an intern in your business is a strategic investment that pays back. Connecting our students to the community through internships is connecting that local student through a local college into a local job, and that's huge for economic development and huge for the community. Uh, so if you'd like to see me and get more information on that, let me know. Uh, some other really great things going on, Celebrate Women, we keep cranking it up. We had Jean Kilborn who studied women's body images and she is a, a phenomenal speaker, research scholar on what media does and how that needs to change. Uh, that was followed by Naomi Tutu the following year, uh, the daughter of Archbishop Desmond Tutu with a fascinating talk. 
uh, to have dinner with her and say, to live on the street of two Nobel Prize winners and to hear conversations about N Nelson Mandela and, and her father uh, was an amazing uh, treat for our campus. And this year we had Dr. Elders, the first African-American Surgeon General of the United States. We keep cranking that up and we're doing great things on that. Uh, we have a partnership with the Lancaster Festival with the Covenant Bridge Music Series, uh, doing an excellent job in identifying singer-songwriters that are on their way up, and it seems like the group does a great job picking them because we find out after they're here, they're getting accolades elsewhere. Uh, theater program is thriving. I encourage you to come out to Wizard of Oz. It's going to be an awesome performance in our new venue, our remodeled venue. Uh, for the future, what we're looking at is Ohio University is following an initiative called Ohio for Ohio. Ohio University serving Ohio. Uh, and this grew out of the idea that we established a medical campus in Dublin and a medical campus in Cleveland, making Ohio University the largest medical school in the state. Realizing that we have an increasing footprint in the state of Ohio, we're now thinking about how we serve that state, and there's a piece of that that directly affects the Lancaster campus because of our proximity to Columbus. They're talking about a central Ohio strategy of Ohio, how Ohio University will work locally. Uh, I will be available after the presentation with any questions. Be happy to give you a card so we can uh, maybe discuss things in the future. Uh, but I'd like to wrap my presentation up now and turn the podium over to Jan Broughton, the superintendent of Fairfield Union Schools. Welcome, Jan. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Smith and, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce for giving us this opportunity to come in and highlight uh, Fairfield Union Local School District. But you know, I want to give a shout out to this morning to uh, the Lancaster City Schools and the students. You know, if, if, if I've been moved at all this morning, I've had a wonderful opportunity. I had a wonderful opportunity to start my morning at the Eastland Fairfield Career Center with an opportunity, and, and uh, Bonnie Hopkins Superintendent is here as well. And I witnessed six or eight of our county students uh, present in front of industry, superintendents, principals, guidance counselors, and I would challenge probably anyone in this room that those students performed so outstanding. They presented, but not only, they fielded questions from that audience just superbly. They, uh, they were professional, they didn't giggle between questions, they handed off the microphone, and so I really want to say thank you. And then I, then I come here and we hear the Lancaster uh, students, the chamber singers, and it just really is moving to hear students. But, you know, I didn't, come, you didn't, I didn't come here for you, for me to give them the accolades as well, but I wanted to talk about Fairfield Union because, you know, students is what we're all about, and, and students are the center and the core of all of our districts, and certainly at Fairfield Union, we want to, again, uh, thank you for allowing us to come. Academically, uh, we're doing very well. Uh, we continue to excel. We're constantly striving for excellence. Uh, we're modifying our programs just as many uh, pro schools in the county as well as Lancaster. We're trying to modify those programs to meet our student needs. And we continue to look at our academic goals and through our building leadership teams, our teacher-based teams, and of course now we have district-wide building leadership teams that are working to modify and look at our programs. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about, just give you a few highlights, I know when Travis asked us to come out, he wanted to really wanted us to talk about our land lab and some of the initiatives that we, we have going on, but before we get into that, I wanted to share just a few little statistics about our school system. As well as I said, you know, academically we're doing very well. You know, athletic we're, athletically we're doing extremely well as, as uh, we are academically. Our students and our staff, they're doing just a phenomenal job. But as far as our enrollment goes, our enrollment is very good. Uh, we do have a little slight decline, but it doesn't seem that way. We're constantly seeing students, uh, open enrolled student, students that are coming in uh, to the district. And so for us, it doesn't seem that way, but it does show a little steady uh, decline. We have approximately 1,985 students currently. Uh, our financial update, financially, we're doing very well. We do show a nominal uh, deficit in 2018. But it's just like any school district or any business entity uh, in Lancaster or Fairfield County, you're always looking at how do you modify that deficit, how do you work with that deficit, how do you make sure that you don't expend more than your revenue is coming in. So we're constantly monitoring our expenditures. 
We look at attrition where possible. Uh, we're constantly reviewing our daily operations and looking at ways, again, going back to how do we meet our student needs, but how do we ab be able to maintain our, our budget and our balance. Uh, transportation is something that, you know, for a city school system, uh, not a lot of times do you have as many buses as we do and maybe not uh, cover as many square miles as we do. Uh, I find that people are interested sometime about transportation, so I have a few facts I just wanted to share with you. We operate between 18 to 20 buses per day. We operate, we actually send those buses to 10 outside agencies, uh, including the Career Center. We average about 2,100 to 22 miles per day, and we have a 100 square mile district. So when we have snow delays, uh, you can only imagine that we're out there checking those snows, uh, those roads, because that's a lot of miles to cover. We modified last year our triple route. We were doing triple route. We brought that back to a double route, again, looking at the needs of our students, looking at the needs of our staff. We came back to a double routing uh, method methodology because we wanted to make sure that we could align our high school and our middle school, some of the staff members that we were sharing between the two buildings, and also our staff. So it really did help us and assistance, assisted us there as well. We do operate our own bus garage. We have two mechanics and a transportation supervisor. And we have purchased four new buses within the last three years since I've been there. And we have also put in place a uh, bus, you know, possess, or, what I want to say, a bus purchase plan for the next few years to also watch that. And just for your information, I don't know if how many of you realize, but a, a school bus costs a district between 80,000 to 90,000 dollars for one school bus. More importantly, you know, this is an area that we feel uh, transportation is not adequately funded across the state of Ohio. But the other thing that we are going to also be embracing this year is we're going to be uh, building a new bus garage. And we've started that process. We have architects in place and the uh, actual the bid will go out to um, the newspaper, I believe, Monday. And one of the things that we're working with our architects is making sure that we try to give back to the community and certainly we've given them lists of local vendors, local contractors that we hope that will be able to participate in that new bus garage. That new bus garage will cost the district somewhere in the neighborhood of $800,000. Uh, to be able to do that, one of the things I wanted to mention is the monies that we're using for that were monies that we earn from our facility projects, such as uh, Lancaster is actually going through, that was transferred over to our permanent improvements. So approximately $800,000 for that bus garage. Academically pro academic program, as Dr. Smith said, one of the things that we're embracing is change in the academic uh, area. This year we implemented several advanced placement classes that we at one time had, and we currently uh, just put them back in place. We offer music theory, chemistry, English language, and composition, United States history, United States government, and politics, and calculus AB. We're hoping to continue those uh, advanced placement classes. We also Many schools are decreasing art and music. We increased our art and music this last year for our elementary students and for our middle school students. We incre increased our college offerings uh, also with dual enrollment plus with College Credit Plus. We're embracing the College Credit Plus and we have several students that are embracing that. And parents, for any of you that have students that are interested in going into college, this is certainly, I have to give a plug for College Credit Plus because it is a real cost savings to a parent if you have students that are going to go on to college. Uh, because the textbooks, for instance, you know, we, per, we pay for the textbooks for your children to go to college. And it is really a wonderful program. So if you have children that are looking at that, whether they're uh, ninth grade, 10th grade, they need to be looking at that and exploring the College Credit, college credit Plus program. We're increasing our career offerings also at the middle school and at the high school. You know, uh, many of you I'm sure know that we have our ag programs, our uh, family consumer science programs. We also have business programs. We still continue them. And we've also embraced the career programs at our middle school. And you say, what's next for us? One of the things that we have, one of the things that we're looking forward to is all day, every day kindergarten. Uh, this will be our first year. We've been a district that have been, you know, the staggering kindergarten, and this has been a goal that the, the district has had for several years. So this fall, we're going to be embracing the all day kindergarten program. 
The other thing that's going to be occurring here uh, shortly is we will have a new superintendent at the uh, Fairfield Union Local School District. Uh, I have been a, a, in public education for over 36 years, and I have shared with the Board of Education, and uh, they have just, they have been wonderful. I can't say enough about my board and my community and the school system I work for. And certainly I, I can't say enough about public education because I truly have enjoyed my life, my career in public ed, but I am stepping down and uh, we are in the process and hopefully by April 18th, the Board of Education will have a new superintendent that is going to be leading the charge and uh, handling all the needs, these projects and initiatives that we certainly have put in place and I'm sure we'll continue with many more. The last thing I would like to talk about is the facilities and grounds. And it, this is just sort of a recap over the last three years. And I'm trying to run through this quickly because I want you to hear about our land lab. But over the last three years, we have actually, we've completely overhauled our technology, our telephone system, our security systems. We built a concession stand. We have marquees. We have new canopies over our sidewalks. We, had, we revitalized our greenhouse. The Ohio State or High School Facilities Commission put the greenhouse in there and it was never used. It's now being utilized. And last but not least is our land lab revitalization. And that's what I want to get into. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Kimmer. And before I do that, though, Mr. Kimmer is a board member for Fairfield Union. And I want you to know that when he tells you how much money has been raised, I have to give him the accolades because he has truly, truly been the individual who has worked with the community and really brought in a lot of these dollars that he's going to share with you. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Kevin Kimmer, uh, our board member at Fairfield Union. Well, thank you, Mrs. Broughton, and uh, so appreciative of uh, the overview that you've given to, uh, about Fairfield Union Schools. Just a small bleep of what's taking place out there at Fairfield Union Schools, so appreciate everything you've done. And, uh, but first, I, I do want to start with this and say, and say how important it is that all our schools, Mrs. Broughton as a superintendent, uh, Mr. Steve Wigdon, it's a team effort. It's a team effort that we have um, that we bring to our, uh, about our schools. And without our leadership of our superintendents of, of Mrs. Broughton, we are so thankful for them and, and to Mr. Wigdon for his leadership at Lancaster City Schools. Uh, I just don't know where we would be without that leadership. And Mr. Smith is, uh, is a leader of uh, OUL. And, and uh, oh, um, we're so thankful for the leadership roles that you've taken on, and I can't thank you enough for, for that leadership roles that you've taken, so, and for the students of, uh, of our school districts. I'd like to first talk about the history um, of our, uh, of our uh, land lab that we have, and the history about our land lab uh, starts back in 1960, how, how it all came about, our outdoor learning facility. How it came about was in 1960, three school districts came together to make one. Uh, those three school districts was Pleasantville, Rushville, and, and uh, Bremen. Those districts came together to make one school district, which was Fairfield Union. That money came in in 1960, and when it came in, the money was for, through the FFA programs, the Fairfield Future uh, Farmers uh, Association program. They decided with that money that they wanted to expand the outdoor learning uh, for, our, for our students. And so with that, Fairfield Union is very blessed with acreage. Um, our school site is, is just east of uh, the Lancaster corporation, cor corporation limits there, out there by Diamond Power. We're five miles east of that location. And out there at that site at Fairfield Union High School, Fairfield Union Middle School, we own, the district owns 190 acres. With that 190 acres, in behind to the south by the football stadium is 44 acres of a, uh, of a land lab outdoor learning facility. Well, with that being said, the foresight was we want to educate our people so that they have that, out, that outdoor learning uh, environment. So I start with this slide here because I love this slide. This slide here is of two young people, uh, and I got the permission through the parents. The one, man, the one young man's name is Josh Henwood. He's a fourth grader at Pleasantville. 
and, he, and it's his brother to the uh, left, and that's Nick Henwood. They're the parents of Dave and Jill Henwood. I love this slide because of this reason. This is before we started the revitalization of the land lab. I, I wish I was a bird and I could understand and I could hear the conversation that they had as they walked back to our covered bridge. Is it, is it, oh my, look at that oak tree or look at that walnut tree or look at the size of that beech tree or is it, do you see that blue bird or did you see that cardinal? Or is it maybe, hey, would you like to take a toad back to maybe so mom could have a toad? Or is it getting back to our ponds? Is that what they want to do so they can skip some rocks or see the, uh, see the covered bridge that we have back there? Um, so how interesting. And then just to the exercise the breath of fresh air to be out there to enjoy that land lab. So I appreciate that because look how much you've learned in just walking out there and walking back. So... As you see on the left, there's a slide there, and that's a covered bridge. We have a covered bridge at our site, and how fortunate and unique we are in having a covered bridge. This covered bridge came to Fairfield, Virginia in 1981. Out at Rushville, the little town of Rushville, there was, a, there was a Rush Creek Lake going in in 1981. The developers came to us and asked us if we would be interested in the covered bridge because when that dam, when that Rush Creek Lake filled up, that covered bridge was going to be 12 feet underwater. So we said, most certainly. So they brought it to our district. We use it, we, we use it for, hist for history reasons. And, uh, and what a, uh, how unique it is to have a covered bridge. Now, as you can see, this is before we started revitalization of our, covered, of our uh, land lab or outdoor learning facil facility. We started into phase one, and I want, to, I want to back up just a little bit as phase one. We partnered. We were fortunate. Dr. Marie Ward, our county superintendent, she came to us and asked us that there was a grant out there, and that grant, that straight-A grant, was offering $20,000 to be able to revitalize outdoor learning facilities. She came to our superintendent, Mrs. Jan Broughton, and asked if we had an interest and, uh, in applying for this grant. We did, we applied for it, and with that being said, uh, we came together as a committee in February of last year. Last year we came together and said, hey, uh, what can we do to improve this outdoor learning facility? Because over the years, as you can see in the pictures, because of lack of funds, lack of uh, uh, time commitments, uh, the uh, land lab had uh, deteriorated. So, so with that $20,000, we as a committee, and I'm so proud of this committee, we said do, we do not want to touch one single dollar of, those educa of that educator money, of that straight A grant through the uh, PASS Foundation. We wanted that $20,000 to stay with the educators to buy the tools they need to educate our young people. We as a committee said, let's go out and see if we can raise so that we can clean our ponds, we can uh, renovate our bridges, we can open up trails, uh, walking trails for our community and for our uh, athletic, for our cross country teams. Let's see if we can raise, so we put a budget together and the budget was $39,000 that we started last April. Well, I can proudly say that with that $39,000 budget, that we have raised right now $42,000 of going to our community and our businesses. How proud that makes us uh, to be able to. So if you total the $20,000 with the straight A grant, we are able to put $62,000 into this land lab facility to help uh, educate our, uh, our, our students. So um, this is phase one. As you can see at the beginning, uh, there, we need to dredge the ponds. We need to renovate the covered bridge so it's safe for our people. That was phase one, as you've seen, was done in May, June, and, and uh, April, May, and June. Here it is in July. Now notice, you noticed how, how everything was so overgrown and so overtaken, but now look, look at our ponds, which have been, uh, uh, been dredged out and, and uh, the finished product of it. Look at our covered bridge. We really feel we have a park-like setting back there, and, um, and we're extremely proud of that. As you can see also, that was, uh, that was all done by July, and then in July we put the uh, cement pillars in so that we can, uh, so that we can this year uh, be able to put the pond dock in place as well. 
So we're awful, awful proud of that and uh, as we continue on. Now, how are we gonna maintain so that we can keep, so that the uh, outdoor learning facility doesn't deteriorate like it had in the past? I don't know if this man I tried to use reverse psychology on me or, or, or what, but it worked, whatever he tried to do, because he said, I'm not sure I want to donate to this because donate my uh, finances or time, eventually uh, it's just going to go back to the way it was. Well, we do not want that to happen, and that's why, as you see in this top slide, we have a community day. First Saturday in October, this past fall, we had our first uh, community day where we invite people in and... Uh, uh, we talk about, the, we have people there, historians that talk about the cover bridge. We have guide tours um, that uh, take people through our trails. Uh, and also uh, we have uh, uh, people are going around to the pond. So every year uh, we have a uh, community day for Saturday in October and that drives us to make sure that we maintain this for our students to have this learning facility. As you can also see, we got a, a uh, we engraved our granite rock as a landmark back there and absolutely love this picture here. This picture here of the covered bridge was taken 60 days ago in uh, February. Just uh, what a Christmas card type picture taken by one of our science teachers, Eric Vivian. So uh, it's, uh, it's amazing how uh, from what, I'll just back up, from what you, from what you see there with the covered bridge to what you see there. So. Um, makes us awful proud. So, with that, with that being said, raising forty-two thousand, we're into phase two. Uh, we're in the planning stages right now. For our educators to be able to educate our young people, they need a they need a, a place to come to, and um, so we have a budget now of twenty thousand dollars that uh, we're going to work towards in the year of two thousand and sixteen, and that's to build our shelter house so that our our learners have a place to come to. And then you can see the uh, dock that we've already got the cement piers in place and, uh, and that as well. So, um, but this is, uh, that's part of what's coming on in 2016. This, this slide here though is, um, puts a smile on my face as I, as I talk about this slide. This is in our Town Crier magazine and uh, this was, what you, was utilized. This is just one part of what was utilized. Our industrial arts teacher, Mr. Judd Baker, has his students back there utilizing the land lab. He tapped, his students tapped 10 maple trees and he, and he was able to teach them how the process works to make, make, to make the process of making maple, maple syrup. Um, and what's so interesting and uh, makes me smile about this project is our food service coordinator, Sally McCanley, was serving uh, French toast uh, and uh, our in industrial arts teacher said to the high school, uh, to all the students of the high school, and our industrial arts teacher said, we'd love to be able to provide that maple syrup for all the students when you have that day of serving French toast. The amazing thing about this is it takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. 40 to one. They had to, re they had to produce, process 10 gallons of maple syrup to be able to have enough to serve our entire high school. So that's, that ratio then is 400 gallons of sap to be able to get to produce, have 10 gallons of maple syrup. But the excitement and the pride that these students had as they, as they, as everyone went through that line and knowing that it came off the land that they produced um, gives me goosebumps right now. So uh, very, uh, what a privilege. So. I end with that slide, and and I um, and I also uh, welcome any of you, or if you'd like to be a friend. Our land lab's open to the public. If you'd like to park back of our parking lot where our football stadium's at, there's a road that goes back there to it. Um, please feel free to come back. Um, it's open. You'll see people back there taking prom pictures, graduation pictures. It won't be surprised to me to see someday a wedding being taking place back there. I mean, we have that uh, setting. So you're so welcome as well to come back uh, uh, and Perfect News and Schools welcomes you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I uh, would also like to uh, thank the Lancaster Fairfield County Chamber of Commerce for allowing us to host this event and also for allowing us uh, to present 
And uh, I do want to say, uh, give a big thank you uh, once again to Leanne Haight. She's our event coordinator for this, and without her, uh, I'd be lost, and uh, I think the whole district would be lost. You've already seen the best of Lancaster City Schools, and those are our students, okay? You've seen our, you've had an experience with our culinary arts folks, our criminal science folks, our health tech folks, and uh, our fantastic chamber, of sing uh, chamber singers, and uh, certainly that is the best of Lancaster City Schools. And if you, if you would please, let's give our culinary arts folks a round of applause. Thank you. I'd like to begin my presentation by saying thank you for renewing our earned income tax this past November. Uh, we're very thankful to have a supportive community and we're proud to be a part of such a strong community which supports the students and staff of Lancaster City Schools. It's because of your support that Lancaster City Schools is a place to be for learning, caring, and succeeding both now and in the future. Our most recent uh, report card shows that the current state of the district is strong. Lancaster City Schools are the place to be for academic achievement. This report card is based upon last year's park tests, which have been replaced by different tests this year. And this makes any comparisons between the old test and last year's park test very difficult. And to add to the difficulty in comparing results, districts were allowed to choose between online testing or paper pencil testing. And since online testing is mandated by the state beginning next year, our district chose to take all tests except the third grade reading test online. And an analysis of districts' test scores have shown that districts who took the paper pencil tests scored better than those districts who took tests online. Now this slide shows that despite the testing discrepancy between districts taking tests online versus paper and pencil, we earned a grade of A for indicators met. Indicators met measures the percent of students who scored proficient or above on state tests and at least 80% of students must earn a proficient or higher score to get credit for the indicator. Out of the state's 33 tests given last year, and yes, there's 33 tests that our kids take, we scored proficient or above on 30 of those 33 tests given. And to put that accomplishment into perspective, we're one of only two districts in Fairfield County to have earned an A in indicators met. Another highlight of the state report card is our graduation rates, which were a grade of A, both four-year and five-year rates. And these are our highest graduation rates to date on state report cards. We're in the second year of providing an all-day, everyday program for gifted students in grades four and five called the Gales Program. And we're proud to say that our gifted education program for all grades ranked in the top 20% of all school districts in the state of Ohio. And our U.S. News and World Report nationally bronze rated high school continues to be one of the top performing schools in the state, ranking in the top 17% of all schools in the state of Ohio in performance index. <clears throat> our enrollment continues to increase in the district. Our current enrollment is 6,340 students in preschool through 12th grade. And because we're a large school district, people sometimes think we're too large to provide our students with individual attention to develop those caring relationships. We put an emphasis on keeping our staff to student ratio low enough to be the place to be for caring relationships. And as you can see, our students to educational staff ratio, which includes our teachers and educational assistants, anybody working individually with students, 13.4 to 1 for preschool through fifth grade, 14 to 1 for grades 6 through 12. 
And now those numbers include that we now have either guidance counselors or social workers that serve all of our school buildings. Our ability to provide individualized services and to perform well on state academic measures is delivered at a relatively low cost. State report card shows that Lancaster City Schools are the place to be for responsible budgeting. Our per pupil cost of $7,873 ranks in the lowest 20% in the state and is the lowest cost per pupil in the county. And most importantly, we are spending our money where it makes the greatest impact on classroom instruction. 71.5% of our funds are spent on instruction for our students. And this ranks us in the top 15% in the state and number one in the county. Our current school construction project makes us a place to be for new elementary schools. We opened three new elementary schools this past August, Gorsuch West, Mount Pleasant, and Tarhee Trails. Our last two schools under construction will open no later than August of 2017. Pictured here is a recent photo of the exterior of the new Medill Elementary Building. Uh, the parent entrance is off James Road and the bus entrance is off Sheridan Drive. And Medill will be our largest elementary school uh, because it is being built to uh, house our preschool program. And here is an inside photo of the entrance to Medill, recently taken, so you can see the progress that's being made inside. Next is a uh, picture of the exterior view of our new Talmadge Elementary School. And uh, the parent entrance for this school will be off Talmadge Avenue, while the bus entrance is off of uh, Lewis Avenue. And following is a picture of the interior recently taken to show you the uh, kind of progress that's being made there. These, there. these buildings are on time and within budget and moving along very, very well. Through your continued support, we're moving toward the completion of our master plan for the replacement of all schools in the district. The Ohio Facilities Construction Commission, referred to as the OFCC, co-funds our master plan. We're in the second phase of the elementary portion of the plan. And uh, with your renewal of our earned income tax in November, we are now able to finance our portion of constructing two new junior high schools. Uh, the final portion of the plan will be to replace Lancaster High School. And we hope to address funding needs for a new high school in the not so distant future so that we can keep Lancaster City Schools a place to be for new school buildings. Here's a summary of the process for the junior high construction project. Currently, we are securing building sites uh, for a new General Sherman and a new Thomas Ewing Junior High. Uh, the planning and construction process, though, cannot begin until the OFCC allocates their portion of the funding, uh, which will hopefully be this July. And the, it's not whether they um, allocate, it's just simply when they allocate uh, the funding. And then once the OFCC allocates our funds, we will proceed with the remainder of the process, uh, which will likely take about three to three and a half years. We have secured a site for a new Thomas Ewing Junior High School. Uh, late last month, we closed on the former Kreitz Farm, which uh, you, you may have ridden horses on. It's located off Sheridan Drive, uh, near the intersection of Rainbow Drive. And this property will provide us uh, plenty of land for the new Thomas Ewing Junior High, along with that athletic field and track. Now the decision uh, was made to abandon the current Thomas Ewing site in order to allow that current site to be utilized when a new high school is constructed. Additional land will be needed when a high school is built, and we assume that there we're, we figure that will be on the same land, uh, primarily to incorporate our career and technical programs which are currently housed here at Stanbury. Uh, thus, the uh, current Thomas Ewing site can then be used for the relocation of the athletic fields that are behind the high school 
or for some uh, other purpose in conjunction with uh, the high school construction. And also by constructing the future Thomas Ewing Junior High on a new site, we'll be able to continue educating students at the current location uh, during this construction project. Now, we have yet to secure a future site for General Sherman Junior High. Uh, I, but I just did hear that there's 190 acres of land out at Fairfield Union. Maybe we can work something out. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, we've been unsuccessful at our uh, attempts to acquire 20 or more acres of land, uh, which has good access and proximity to utilities on the west side. Uh, to date, owners of these potential properties uh, have, uh, that we've identified have either um, shown no interest or have set an asking price that's twice the appraised value. So constructing a uh, new school on the current General Sherman site is not a viable option because it only has 10 acres and it's located in a floodplain. And that means a lot of dollars to remediate the, uh, the land in order to build there. So at this point, we're continuing to explore possibilities for a future site for our General Sherman Junior High, and we certainly hope to have a property secured this summer. Now, new facilities are not the only changes you'll see in the coming year from Lancaster City Schools. We're always looking for ways to improve our educational options to make us a place to be for new educational programs. Listed here are four programs that will be added for next school year. The first program is an expansion of the STEM program implemented this year at Lancaster High School. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And uh, we will be implementing Project Lead the Way, which will allow us to increase the number of students in our STEM program and provide them with two pathways, engineering and biomedical. Our next program is the addition of Spanish for high school credit in eighth grade. Spanish will be the second foreign language offered in eighth grade as we'll continue to offer our world languages as well. And over the next two years, we'll be expanding our gifted elementary program in our elementary grades to serve gifted students before they enter into our all day every day Gales program in grades four and five. And the last new program is an exciting program, a preschool partnership that we will launch with Fairfield County Head Start. Uh, this partnership will allow us to share services and increase the number of students we can serve in our preschool programs. Our partnership with Fairfield County Head Start is just one of many community partnerships. And we're fortunate to be part of such a wonderful giving community. We value the many partnerships we have with community organizations as we work together to provide the best experience for the students in Lancaster City Schools. We have attempted to list all the organizations in the community which, with which we have partnerships that work in our buildings. If I included the athletic partnerships, we don't have enough time to run through all of those. On the slides are 35 organizations that we were able to identify, making Lancaster City Schools the place to be for community partnerships. I began my presentation with a thank you for your continued support for the renewal of our earned income tax. And I want to end by thanking you for partnering with us to make Lancaster the place to be to raise a family. Together, we are doing, and we will continue to do, great things for the children of Lancaster City Schools. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers that uh, joined us today. We appreciate your time and your updates. Um, we have the culinary students back here. Let's give them another round of applause. Uh, once again, thank you for uh, Lancaster City Schools for hosting us, all those that helped uh, today, and uh, even the man behind the, uh, the curtain over here, too, our IT uh, professional. Yeah, there he is. Yeah. 
So thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, mark your calendars. The next Chamber of Commerce event uh, coming up is the State of the County Address on April 19th at the Liberty Center, which will be another luncheon as well. Thank you all for coming. Have a great week.